We're going to talk, excellent, thank you. We're gonna, my name is Maureen McCullough, and I come out of Los Angeles. How many of you guys are from California? Raise your hands. Good, a pretty good number. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about opiates, and there'll be some good California laws that we'll be talking about briefly. All right, we're going to talk about pediatric chest x-rays and abdominal x-rays. This is a lecture on plain film imaging. I want to show you a lot of x-rays. We're not really going to talk about management or treatment. It's really like, what am I seeing on an x-ray? If you're getting an x-ray and there's stuff there to be seen, you want to know what you're looking at. Nope. All right, I'm going to learn how to do this. There we go. Click on the left is the key. Okay, a little bit on chest x-rays. Chest x-rays are probably one of those common x-rays you're going to get in young children. So let's just go through a few things. The first is that a plain film on a young baby, the mediastinum is going to look really, really wide. You're going to think this child is cardiomegaly. And what you're really seeing is the thymus. It's very generous up until about six months of age. and some kids, it's a little bit longer. But it's going to have this very prominent, wide mediastinum. Oh, OK, thank you. Oh, OK, perfect. Sounds good. This is an MRI showing that thymus. This is why on a two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional object, that mediastinum on the plain film chest x-ray is going to look really, really wide. The thymus can do something kind of interesting. It'll kind of creep in between ribs and get this kind of straight line appearance called the sail sign. That's very, very normal. What thymus tissue won't do is push tissue out of the way, move normal tissue out of the way. We'll talk about trachea is being deviated, that's never the thymus tissue doing this. So if you see this kind of straight appearance to something up in that right upper lobe area, that's probably the thymus. On a lateral film, in an adult, behind that sternum, you're supposed to be a little bit hyperlucent because your thymus has kind of shrunk down to nothing. In young kids, that area is going to be hyperdense because they have thymus tissue right behind that sternum. If in a young baby, an infant less than six months of age, it is hyperlucent, there's a lucency there. It means they don't have thymus tissue or maybe lacking thymus tissue, and that's DeGeorge syndrome, so something you want to kind of pick up on that lateral. You want to get a good inspiratory film on a young baby. Sometimes this is hard. They put them in those little kind of cone things, and the tech is trying to click when the baby does a big inspiration while they're crying. If you see the x-ray on the left, that's poor inspiration. You're not getting a lot of vertebrae, maybe seven or eight vertebrae you're seeing on that film. The heart looks large. The lung fields look a little dense. That same baby, now taken by a better tech, he clicks right when the baby takes a big inspiration. And you see... Many more ribs, you see kind of hyperlucent lungs, very normal lung fields, normal sized heart, and that kind of sail sign appearance to the thymus. Again, very, very normal. A couple other just views of the thymus. If you're making the diagnosis of right upper lobe pneumonia in a young, young baby, a three month old, reconsider that maybe you're looking at the thymus, especially if it's kind of a homogeneous. I've seen them look almost like a total whiteout on the right, if they're depending on how they take the film, if they're turned to the right too much. So it can take up a good portion of that right lung field. So again, if you're kind of thinking, is this a right upper lobe pneumonia, maybe have your radiologist read the film because you might be dealing with a thymus tissue, totally normal. So when you're looking at an x-ray, depending on the kid that's in front of you, you may be wondering, is this child have cardiac disease? Well, what are you looking for on the film that may give you a clue? In an older patient, we look at the cardiac silhouette and we measure it. Is it more than half of the thoracic ratio? We can't really do that in young babies, one, because it's hard to get an inspiratory film, and two, because you've got this thymus that's really contributing to the mediastinum. So what are the things that we can be looking for on an x-ray that might give you a clue that you're dealing with congenital heart disease? The real answer is on the lateral. So the first thing you want to look at is the posterior edge of the heart. On the lateral, if it starts to encroach on the vertebrae, that's a generous heart you may be dealing with congenital heart disease. The other thing to look at is what's called this anterior tracheal line. There we go. You run a line down the very front of the trachea. What should happen is it should go down and bisect the diaphragm. If it's pushed backwards, that's the heart that's kind of pushing that tracheal line backwards. If it starts to go toward the vertebrae instead of down more toward the diaphragm, that's a sign you may be dealing with cardiomegaly. So you want to run a line down the anterior tracheal area. If it bisects the diaphragm, great. If it starts to push backwards, that's encroaching on the vertebrae. That's a sign you may be dealing with congenital heart disease. Again, coming straight down is normal. Bisecting the diaphragm, if it starts to be pushed backwards, that's a generous heart pushing it backwards, and it's now starting to bisect the vertebrae 
abnormal. Again, a normal. Sometimes it's hard to see the anterior, to see the trachea on the lateral, but if you can, you want to run that line down, you want to see it bisecting the diaphragms. Push back a little bit more. This is starting to encroach on that, at that anterior trachea line. You run it all the way down, it's starting to bisect the vertebrae. Again, more generous heart, you may be dealing with congenital heart disease. And then a little bit more obvious. Run it down the anterior portion of the trachea. It pushes backwards. It's encroaching on the vertebrae. It's not bisecting the diaphragm. Again, a very generous heart is kind of pushing that backwards. So let's go through a case, because this is not untypical of a case you might see. But there are various things you might come up on the chest x-ray that could give this same similar presentation. So you have a six-week-old female. The baby's had a little bit of a URI symptoms. Now the mom brings the baby in because there seems to be some real respiratory distress. You see a retracting, tachyptic infant in front of you. Baby's tachycardic, breathing in the 60s, and the pulse ox isn't great. You get a chest x-ray, and what do you see? Well, several things might show up. If it's in the winter, it's a young baby, started off with a URI, you might be dealing with bronchiolitis. Now, with bronchiolitis, you don't have to get a chest x-ray. If it's the middle of January, and it's a one-year-old, and it started off with a URI, and now the baby's wheezing and tachypnic and retracting and grunting, it looks like a zebra, it walks like a zebra, it's probably a zebra, right? It's probably what you're dealing with, it's probably bronchiolitis. But on an x-ray, what might you see? Again, not every bronchiolytic baby needs a chest x-ray, but what if you got a chest x-ray, what are you going to see? They're basically dealing with hyperinflation. They're air stacking. They're able to breathe in, but they can't let the air out, so they get hyperinflated. What does that mean on the x-ray? On the AP view, you're going to have more vertebrae than typical. Typical is 7, 8. Maybe you're seeing 8, 9 vertebrae. What's more indic indicative of um, hyperinflation is really on the lateral. And that's looking for a flattening of the diaphragms. Rather than the kind of the dome shape that we typically see, you're going to have more of a straight line appearance on the lateral. That's the most sensitive view, and that's what radiologists are going to be looking for to say, hey, it looks hyperinflated. You also can see on the AP views what they call peribronchial cuffing, peribronchial opacities. They're just kind of little filled in dots, and that's the little bronchial with the little edema seen on end. So this parabronchial opacities, parabronchial cuffing, and this hyperinflation indicated on the lateral by a flattening of the diaphragm, that's what the radiologist is looking for when he calls it bronchiolitis. Again, hyperinflated, more ribs than normal seen, more ribs than normal seen on the AP view, and more of a flattening of the diaphragm than you typically see. That's how you're diagnosing bronchiolitis, this hyperinflation. Congenital lobar emphysema. This is, this is something the baby's been born with. Now, depending on the amount, the size of this abnormal lung tissue, and this is really kind of the alveolar level, this is the problem. The baby may present in the newborn nursery or in the delivery room. But if it's not that much of the lung tissue, the baby's tooting along, doing pretty well, and now gets a cold, and suddenly in the lower respiratory tract tree, and it tips the baby over the edge, and they come into the emergency room. You look at this x-ray, and you're like, damn, that really looks like what? Attention pneumothorax, and then you have to back up and go, wait a minute. Why does this six-week-old have attention pneumothorax? Why does this 10-week-old have attention pneumothorax? Because if it's going to present, it generally presents pretty early. If you hot light this, for those of you that have the old kind of view boxes, remember you used to hot light them? Or if you put on your synapse, you invert it on your digital images, you'll see lung markings all the way out. Let me do this over here you'll see very scattered lung markings. This is not a tension pneumo. In a tension pneumo, you'd see no lung markings in that hyperlucent field. But here, you're going to see very scattered, very few, but scattered lung markings. This kid does not need a chest tube. This kid needs to be admitted. This kid needs to be in oxygen. They probably need a resection of that lung tissue. But this kid does not need a chest tube. This is abnormal lung tissue the child's been born with. Same thing, a little bit more hyperlucent on one side, more hyperlucent than is acceptable as normal on one side. It looks more radiolucent, fewer lung markings, but if you hotlight it, there are lung markings that go all the way out to the end. Again, the kid may have been doing pretty well until they got some type of URI, lower respiratory tract infection that tipped them over the edge. Pneumatoceles, same thing. They can be born with it. It can be post-pneumonia. Again, it's a problem, this kind of 
abnormal lung tissue. You get this x-ray and you just kind of see this kind of bleb in the area. Again, the kid could have been tooting along pretty well. You get this chest x-ray, what am I looking at? A problem in the lower lung tree. Again, a lot of times it's post-pneumonia, but they can be born with it. A lot of times the babies have been on a ventilator in the NICU, and they could now, that's a lot less frequent to see that. It used to be more common, but occasionally you'll still see a baby that develops this. Diaphragmatic hernia, again, this typically is in the delivery room. They born with respiratory distress. They have that scaphoid abdomen because all their bowels up in their left chest typically. But depending on the size of the di how much lung, how much bowel is up there, they may toot along pretty well for a couple months. And then they get, I had a kid about 10 weeks old, and he presented with a kind of an RSV picture. We got a chest x-ray, and we're like, wow, that's bowel in that. And he had some kind of abnormal lung sounds on that side. Not a lot of lung sounds, a lot of breast sounds on that side. And there were clear bowel gas pattern in that left side. So every once in a while, a kid can toot along pretty well, and then presents to the urgent care or to the ER. You get a chest x-ray, and you're like, this looks like a diaphragmic hernia. When you're looking at a chest x-ray, one of the questions you want to ask yourself, is this congenital heart disease, depending on the baby that's in front of you? What are some signs that we're going to think? We're going to go through all of these. First is the cardiac. Where's the position? What size is it? We're going to go over that. What's the vasculature? Too many vessels, too few. Where's the heart? Is it on the correct side of the chest or the wrong side of the chest? And then a right-sided aortic arch. What are some signs of that? So the first we talk about, first is, is the heart on the correct side of the chest? We'll talk about dextrocardia high rates of congenital heart disease. We already talked about the size of the heart. Hard to use the AP. They don't take good inspirations. They have large thymus tissues. Use the lateral. Remember that anterior tracheal line needs to bisect the diaphragm. And then the contour. We'll talk about you know, the boot-shaped heart. I'll show you some pictures. Those are harder to see in young babies, especially with thymus tissue kind of obscuring everything. They're generally a little bit more helpful the older the child is. What are we talking about here? So the first is Tetralogy of Fallot, or tricuspid atresia. This is that kind of boot-shaped heart, generally with a kind of an opacity of blood vessels, not a whole lot of blood vessels, lacking of blood vessel tissue. Again, in a young baby, less than six months of age, less than 10 months of age, it's going to be harder because the thymus tissue is going to be so prominent. But certainly in an older child, you may get lucky enough to see this kind of classic appearance. Transposition of the great vessels, they get this kind of egg on a string appearance, which is a very narrow mediastinum, narrow mediastinum, and this kind of bulbous heart there. And the other one is snowman figure or figure of eight. They kind of have this bulbous top and then another bulbous down here kind of looking like a snowman sign or a figure of eight sign. Again, usually obscured in a very young infant because of the thymus. As the kid gets older, the thymus kind of shrinks down, and you're more likely to see some of these classic appearances to the heart. Increased, so one of the things to look at is vasculature. Increased vasculature. In general, the vessel should really kind of be at the kind of the central third. You start seeing vessels out to the middle third of the lung field, certainly to the periphery, just in older patients. That's too many blood vessels. That's congestion. That's overflow to the lungs. This shows some blood vessels out in middle third. Again, they should stay more at the hilar area. You start seeing vessels out to the middle third, vessels out to the middle third. That's a little bit more generous. You're talking about increased flow, increased vascular congestion. Decreased flow, there's a lacking of blood vessels, tetralogy flow, cyanotic baby in front of you. Sometimes you have to use the baby in front of you and then go back and look at the x-ray. I go, yeah, wait, I have a cyanotic kid in front of me. I can't get their O2 sats up. I go back and look at the x-ray again. Sometimes I'll pull up a normal x-ray just to remind myself, what does the normal blood vessels look like? And then you're like, yeah, you're right. There is too much lucency here. I'm not seeing a whole lot of blood vessels. There's not enough blood flow to the lungs. I've got a cyanotic baby in front of you. Put the clinic, clinical picture together. This can be a little bit harder to tell. So we looked at the size, we looked at now looking at the position, we looked at the contour of the heart. So this is about dextrocardia. You want to look for the cardiac apex and you want to look for the stomach bubble. Does the child have dextrocardia or situs inversus? You have dextrocardia and the heart's on the wrong side of the chest, that cardiac apex, assuming they didn't invert something. Again, look for the stomach bubble. Stomach bubble's on the left 
and the cardiac apex on the right, that's a high rate of cardiac disease. The funny thing is, if they have dextrocardia and situs inversus, everything's backwards, then the rate of cardiac disease goes way down. We had a lady a couple years ago with situs inversus. She knew it. She knew her gallbladder was on the wrong side. I didn't tell the residents. I sent them in there with the ultrasound machine. They're like, came out going, what the heck? And she had the gallbladder on the wrong side. So again, dextrocardia, high rates of congenital heart disease. If everything's backwards, intestines, everything's backwards, the rate goes down. And the last thing is this right-sided aortic arch. Now, so normally, our aorta curves over to the left. So our trachea normally should be a little bit pushed to the right. That's normal. Aorta goes left, trachea a little bit to the right. If you see the trachea pushed to the left, A, that's not thymus. Thymus doesn't do that. B, among other, it could be mediastinal stuff, but on the differential is a right-sided aortic arch. And right-sided aortic arches have a high propensity for congenital heart disease. Not only is the aorta bad, but everything below it is bad. So if you see that trachea abnormally pushed to the left, one of the differentials is a right-sided aortic arch. If you have a cyanotic kid in front of you, that may be a telltale sign that you're dealing with congenital heart disease. Again, trachea pushed to the left is not normal. It's not the thymus, something else. Okay, switching gears. A little bit on foreign bodies. You have a kid comes in, kid has a story of choking, either they're asymptomatic, they're still symptomatic when they come to the ER, your inclination is to get a chest x-ray. It's the modality we have in the ER, right? Sometimes you're lucky enough to see something. So what are those things that we might see? You might see lobar segmental collapse. They've got the foreign body there and everything post just kind of collapses behind it. You may see hyperlucency. They kind of get that ball valve appearance and so they get hyperlucent behind that foreign body. It gets more hyperinflated. And you can get a post-obstructive infiltrate. The foreign body's there, there's a lot of edema in the area, and it just kind of swells up and gets an infiltrate. Sometimes you're lucky enough to get that on the x-ray. Then it's like a no-brainer, right? Kid came in choking, you've got an abnormal x-ray, the kid clearly needs to get scoped. Unfortunately, most, a lot of the x-rays can be completely normal. So about a third of x-rays can be absolutely normal, and yet the child still has a foreign body down there. Now, we weren't going to talk about the management. There's some people say we, are, we ought to be moving to CT scan, a, a kind of focused CT scan of the area. But right now, we're just going to talk about plain films. The longer the child is symptomatic, the longer, or at least the longer the child has been since the choking episode, when the foreign body first got into the lung fields, the, lo the longer that occurs, the more time that passes, the less likely the child's going to have a normal x-ray. Something's going to show up, an infiltrate, hyperinflation. But if they come in pretty quickly, the x-ray can be completely normal. So one of the things we do, what we typically have done, is either an expiratory film, and some of you may not know this, and you can actually see it's actually a forced expiration. So here the kid's taking a breath, and here the technologist with his hand is actually going in there and kind of shoving the baby's belly to make him do a forced expiration. That's called an expiratory film. Or what we typically do is like a decubitus film. We put the kid down. We put the kid down. The theory behind both of these is that because of air trapping, if you either force the kid to have an expiration, this side does not deflate. That's the side of the foreign body. Or the side that's dependent is supposed to kind of squish down. But in this case, this one's a little bit subtle. This is not squishing down as much as it should. It's not as dense as it should be. It's staying hyperinflated. Kind of pointing to, hey, I think there's a problem on this side. Maybe there's a foreign body. They actually looked at the cubes versus expiratories. This was out of Seattle Children's. They looked about 11 years, 300 kids. They all got either a PA or a P chest X-ray, and then an expiratory decubitus films. They looked at the utility of them. When they added the decubitus, it seemed to increase their false positive rate, so they chased a lot of stuff that wasn't there. But if they added an expiratory film, it seemed to increase the true positives. There was actually something there. And so they switched their protocols, and they always do expiratory films, or at least they were. And another study looked at 41 kids. They all underwent bronchoscopy, so it's a kind of a sub-segment of all the kids that are kind of getting to the ER. 28 of them had an AP chatteral chest x-ray plus a decube, and they thought the decube sensitivity was really, really low. Again, kind of an argument for maybe getting expiratory films. Not all your techs may be aware of how to do that. Sometimes you have to get the supervisor involved and get them all trained on this kind of, it's not a new way, it's clearly been around. The easier way, obviously, for the tech is just to flip the kid left and right. Get him to put a hand on the kid's belly sometimes. It takes a little training. Foreign bodies, remember, sometimes you see the foreign body. 
Remember that in a young baby, a foreign body can be in the esophagus and yet cause respiratory distress because it's pushing from behind on the trachea. The trachea collapses and it can act like respiratory distress. And you're thinking that's got to be an airway problem. No, it's in the esophagus. How do you tell? If it's on the esophagus, it's going to look at you straight on, right? On the lateral, you can see it's actually behind the trachea. Remember also, I don't have a picture of it, but if you think we're in Vegas, if you think of the trachea as a slot machine, like the vocal cords look like this, there's only one way for the coin to go in, and that's straight on like a slot machine. And so it's generally, not 100% of the time, but generally going to be more right on at you, looking at you this way as opposed to that way. So esophagus this way, trachea more that way. Remember, they can present with respiratory distress, even if it's in the esophagus. And a little bit on abdominal series. Again, not a film we get a lot in kids, but if you do, what are some of the things that might be indicated to get an abdominal series? You might see a bowel obstruction. We'll go over bowel obstructions versus ileus. Necrotized enterocolitis, we'll show this at the end. It tends to be a diagnosis of newborns, of premature babies in the NICU. Every once in a while, a normal newborn term newborn might have it. Post-op, you might see a foreign body, retained foreign body. Quarters, batteries, things that are swallowed or inhaled. Pneumoperitoneum, depending on the child and what the, the clinical condition is going on. Toxic megacolon, maybe you feel a palpable mass. Bowel perforation, if you have an unstable trauma patient, can't get to the CAT scan, sometimes we'll do an abdominal x-ray just to see what's going on. We know that the sensitivity is not great, but if there's an unstable fracture, maybe we see that on the plain film. For most of the cases that we're dealing with in young kids, we're thinking ileus, bowel obstruction, this kid's vomiting, he's got a very tender abdomen. Maybe we're getting a plain film on this child. And I have a hard time telling large bowel from small bowel in adults. It's almost impossible in little kids. They lack the valvuli, they lack haustra. It's hard to tell large intestine from small intestine on little babies, on little kids. In kids with a bowel obstruction, they're more likely to get kind of this smooth bowel wall pattern rather than dilated bowel like we see in older patients. It's more of a smooth bowel wall pattern. So what's the difference between ileus and an obstruction on the x-ray? So again, the bowel obstruction, again, is more like these smooth bowel wall patterns. The radiologist will talk about a bag of sausages, and it almost looks like if you put a bag of sausages on this kid's belly and took an x-ray, it'd kind of give that pattern, right? This kind of long loops of bowel, smooth bowel, not necessarily dilated, can be, but more likely you're just getting kind of this smooth bowel wall appearance. What about, there's another one, just kind of more bowel wall, loops of bowel wall, long loops, smooth walls. Not always dilated, but more smooth wall appearance. What about an ileus? This is more air throughout the abdomen, it's totally disorganized. The radiologist will talk about a bag of popcorn appearance. Again, you drop a bag of popcorn on top of this kid's belly, took an x-ray, it's just kind of jumbled air. Jumbled air all over the place. An ileus pattern. That's what the radiologists are kind of looking at if they're calling this out of a plain film x-ray. Bag of popcorn versus bag of sausages. So again, on the left side, you have that kind of disorganized bowel, air all over the place, bag of popcorn appearance, more of an ileus pattern. On the right, bag of sausages, kids vomiting, you see these loops of bowel, smooth bowel walls, that kid's got a bowel obstruction. A little bit on intussusception. Again, this is, tends to be the kind of the older infant or the young toddler. They come in with this colicky abdominal pain. It's this intussuscepted bowel inside bowel. The longer it gets stayed there, the more at risk they have for dying bowel. The sicker this kid's going to get. Ultrasound, CT scans, a, a barium enema are ways to make the diagnosis. You might see something on plain films. It's not 100%, but if it's there to be seen, what are you going to see? So the first thing is maybe a soft tissue mass, kind of here in the right upper quadrant. You might see a dilated loop of bowel, this transverse colon. They have something called the absent liver edge. Basically, you go from liver to kind of mid-abdomen with not a real change in the density. It's just kind of falls off to nothing. There's no liver edge that you typically will see. This is the target sign. It was actually there on the previous film. This is actually the intussusception. You're seeing it on end. You get this density with this kind of lucency around it. That's the intussusception on cross-section. And this crescent sign is the intussusception seen on the kind of the diagonal there. Again, not 
But man, if it's there on the film to be seen, you want to know what to look for. So that absent liver edge, that dilated transverse colon, that mass maybe up in the right upper quadrant because it tends to be on this side of the belly, that target sign that we're seeing there, and that crescent sign is kind of the trans is, is the interception kind of seen on end. Little bit on volvulus, this tends to be little, little babies. They're born with that malrotation. Their intestines are not tacked down real well, and at some point it twists. And it's generally in the first few weeks of life. So everything proximal to the twist is obstructed, and they, get, they start to fill up with air. So they're going to have a lot of proximal air. And everything behind the twist, they're gonna, air is going to pass out their rectum. So they're going to lose a lot of hair distally. So what they get is what's called proximal air and a gasless abdomen. Some kind called the double bubble sign. They'll get an air in the proximal stomach and then maybe a little air in the duodenum. Double bubble sign. Proximal air, the rest is a gasless abdomen. So proximal air, big stomach bubble here, a couple little bits of air around, but mostly a gasless abdomen. Mostly a gasless abdomen. Here's a little bit of stomach air, maybe a little duodenal air, double bubble sign. Proximal air, gasless abdomen. Pretty classic for volvulus. And then last is this pneumatosis intestinalis. This is hard to see because I think the room is a little bright. But basically, this is an overwhelming bacterial infection. Again, tends to be in our preterm babies. Every once in a while, you'll get it in an, in a, in an older baby. They have intraportal air that can be seen, these kind of little wisps of hyperlucency in the portal area. That's not normal. Smooth bowel wall. They're starting to develop a bowel obstruction. You actually get air in the bowel wall, these little strips of air coming through there. And then air out here where it's not really in the intestine anymore. It's kind of in the soft tissue. Not in the colon and not in the intestines. And this clearly has bowel air in the bowel wall. Something bad is going. Again, it tends to be in premature kids. They have an overwhelming infection. If it's an older child, they tend to do a little bit better um, and more likely need surgery. And with that, I thank you very much.